Okay, so moving along, uh, the next talk is uh, going to be given by Meredith Craigie from Adelaide. Um, Meredith uh, is a specialist pain medicine physician and vice dean of the Faculty of Pain Medicine of the Australian and New Zealand College of Anaesthetists. Uh, Meredith graduated in medicine from the University of Adelaide and trained in anaesthesia in Adelaide, followed by two years in the UK doing subspecialty training in paediatrics. She returned to the Adelaide Children's Hospital as a staff anaesthetist in 92, where she was gradually drawn into managing children with complex pain. A move to Flinders Medical Centre in 2004 to finish a Master of Pain Medicine degree while working in the Department of Anaesthesia ended 10 years later when she was lured into full-time pain medicine with the team in the pain management unit at the Royal Adelaide Hospital. Meredith joined uh, our editorial team at the Journal last year after being a reviewer for 20 odd years. Her interests include the safe use of opioids, paediatric anaesthesia and pain management, transition from acute to chronic pain and the role of medicinal, medicinal cannabis in managing persistent pain. Some of the more challenging aspects of Meredith's transition from paediatric anaesthesia to adult pain medicine have been the overlap with addiction medicine and of course mental health disorders. Uh, medicinal cannabis is one of the latest challenges Meredith is looking at. And Meredith is going to speak to us today about the safety of buprenorphine and other long-acting analgesics for acute pain management. Thank you, Meredith. Uh, thanks very much, John. So you can all relax. I'm not going to get you to stand up, put your hands up, do any complex memory tasks, um, <laughs> but I hope to challenge you in a slightly different way. Now, you probably notice on my title slide there that um, I've modified it a little bit because I thought, oh, you read this and you go, oh, no, not another pharmacology lecture. I hope I'm not going to do that to you. But I think it is a challenging area and sometimes we're damned if we don't and we're damned if we do. So John's covered my declaration of uh, uh, interests here. I don't have any conflicts as I give this talk. And what I hope to cover over this next little time is why are we still talking about the safety of opioids? What are some of the problems? Uh, what specifically is it about buprenorphine and the long-acting formulations of opioids in particular? And do they have a future? Because we've been hearing quite a bit over this week, uh, weekend um, about the problems and the options for opioid-free anaesthesia. So why do we have a problem? One of it is getting the balance right between our ethical obligations, as highlighted by um, Frank Brennan, Dan Carr, and Michael Cousins back in 2007. And for those of you who aren't particularly pain oriented the International Association for the Study of Pain started the International Year Against Pain uh, back in 2004, and it just happens of quite conveniently that this year is the Global Year Against Pain After Surgery. So it's quite timely that we're talking about this topic. But basically, uh, Brennan, Carr and Cousins were saying that we have an ethical responsibility to provide pain management. And they even went as far as to suggest that failing to do so amounted to malpractice. We also have learned over the last 20 years about the incidence of chronic pain after surgery. And this particular um, table is out of acute pain management scientific evidence, the fourth edition. I don't expect you to read it, and I'm sure you're all familiar with what it would say. But it highlights a group that we might need to keep in mind, the female patient, the younger patient, and those with anxiety who might be more at risk of that transition. And we might want to think a bit harder about how do we use our uh, analgesic medications for uh, addressing this issue. So we come to the reason for this talk. And it's 
based on publications in anaesthesia and intensive care. And back in 2011, Pam McIntyre, John and David Scott uh, published a review of the problems that we have with opioid-induced ventilatory impairment. And I commend this article to you. It is really comprehensive and covers all the perspectives besides what we commonly call respiratory depression. And you would think, having provided us with such comprehensive advice, that we might be doing pretty well. Unfortunately, not. So from uh, a group here in Perth, actually, and uh, I commend the um, authors for being diligent in their following up of their patients, we have had a case series of six cases published back in March this year, outlining some problems with buprenorphine postoperatively in elderly patients. I must say I was a little concerned about their definition of elderly because the youngest one was 68, and that's getting a little bit close to where I'm at these days, and I'm worrying about my cognitive impairment, Nat. Nat. <laughs> so, so, but it, they're an interesting series, and I'm going to come back to them. But I also have been reading another reputable journal, and this is the Weekend Australian, just from a month ago, that uh, details the problem that's emerging in the USA of prescription opioid misuse. And what I wanted to highlight out of this article was the cases of young Zachary and Noah, both of whom developed their dependency after having sporting injuries. They were both um, highly um, um, successful young sportsmen. They had an injury. They ended up in hospital having some surgery and opioids for their post-operative pain management. And lo and behold, they developed an addiction problem. And it very nicely details the transition into um, drug addiction, dependence, and tragically, um, young Zachary died. And the other lad, has lifelong addiction and will never reach his potential. Why are we concerned about this? It's because 6% of patients are still on a new opioid six months after their surgery. So they've been opioid naive people come in and had their surgery and it didn't need to be necessarily uh, major surgery, complicated surgery, uh, but they are still using opioids six months later. What we also know from other uh, information in the chronic pain area is that if you are still on your opioid at one year after surgery, you are unlikely to ever get off it. So there are sort of problems in the four domains. We see a disconnection from the primary purses, purpose in why that person is still on the medication, and a lot of it may be around preventing withdrawal after it's lost its efficacy. We also see in our older patients an increased risk of falls, cardiovascular events, and all-cause mortality risk. And I think these are important things for us to be uh, cognizant of. Also important for us is their increased risks at their next surgery. And one of the things that persistent opioid use does is impair immune function. So certainly in the chronic pain area, we see an increased risk of uh, important infections like life-threatening pneumonia um, and other infections of unusual um, um, fungi, bacteria in our patients. And this may impact on what's happening for your patient in the operating theatre, but I digress. And of course, addiction is an issue. So you might say, ah, oh, but those were American cases. You know, we know they've got the opioid epidemic. Well, in Australia, we have the Pennington Institute and they publish an annual report of um, the uh, mortality related to all 
types of drug overdose. They collect data from the Australian Bureau of Statistics and the coroner's courts. And what we see, if you look at the red line, is a rising rate of death of Australians due to drug overdose. And if you look at the green line, that's mortality from car accidents, that is going down. And the number of deaths from drug overdose is now double our annual uh, car accident death rate. That is rather an alarming um, statistic. Now, you recall I mentioned that we're concerned about the young female anxious patient. Well, this is a different group. These are mostly middle-aged men at a rate of two to one woman. And in fact, the uh, data now indicates that the death rate from illicit drugs in the young age group is going down and has, has halved over the last five years. So that's some good news. The bad news is that our middle-aged men are inadvertently dying. And the scary thing is that about 74% of these deaths are accidental. And opioids are the main culprit. So, uh, on the um, graph there, you can see the red line, that's all opioids. The statistics are actually collected in uh, two groups. So the ABS collects statistics on um, clustered together of oxycodone, morphine and codeine. And then they collect uh, another set of data on fentanyl, pethidine and tramadol. And over the last 10 years, the uh, rate of uh, deaths from fentanyl has increased by nine times and that is mostly due to um, uh, increasing use of uh, misuse of fentanyl in the community. So we've got a problem. Why are these drugs a problem? Why are they challenging to use? We know that there are a number of issues going on there. Uh, traditional teaching, of course, is post-op pain relief, is opioids with a few other things. There are a wide range of formulations available now, and, and these are all being used as people are trying to do better, and we can't blame them for that. But we know that they have complex mechanisms of action. We know now that opioids can be pro-nociceptive as well as anti-nociceptive and they have quite variable pharmacokinetics, depending on which drug you've used and what formulation you're using. We've heard a little bit from um, Professor Michael Veltman earlier in the weekend about uh, some of the changes that are seen in chronic pain, but we know there's neuroimmune adaptation going on. It happens fairly quickly in, for some people, and it's related to uh, glial cell sensitization. And in fact, both Mark Hutchison and Peter Grace are uh, Adelaide boys who've done some fantastic research with Linda Watkins in, in uh, Colorado over the years. What is it about buprenorphine? Respiratory depression is the key to uh, understanding why people are using it, I think. Um, we're promised that there's an apparent ceiling effect on it. But the important thing to note is that that research was done in healthy young volunteers, and they even had a reduction in their baseline minute ventilation of 50%. Back to our cases, one of the ladies was uh, 78 years old. She had a total knee replacement. She had a sciatic nerve catheter placed with some clonidine put in with the ropivacaine. She had a femoral nerve catheter placed and 300 micrograms of buprenorphine put in with that uh, ropivacaine. A propofol infusion for sedation and then post-operatively, the sciatic catheter was removed, the femoral one continued with 2% ropivacaine 
at six mils an hour and um, she was started on a North Span patch an hour after she uh, got out of theatre. Now, what happened over the next 24 hours was uh, the next day her femoral nerve catheter was removed um, and, of course, the block was starting to wear off. She had her North Span patch on, but you can see from the graph there that it's going to take maybe 24 hours to be uh, kicking into having a good analgesic effect. It wasn't working too well for her, so she ended up having um, another 12 and a half milligrams of oxycodone over several hours. That wasn't working so well. She had some buprenorphine and she received five doses of 200 micrograms over 10 hours. And by 48 hours post-op, she was very, very attended. And that was six hours after the last dose of buprenorphine. Altogether, because I'm a pain physician these days, we like to think about things in oral morphine equivalents, she had something like 68 to 80 milligrams of oral morphine plus the clonidine. And I would put it to you that the slow onset respiratory depression there from the buprenorphine, in addition to two other sedative drugs, created the problem. Our problems with our slow release formulations, again, not to dwell on it, is that they provide a background infusion and they don't allow for incident pain. So you'll get similar problems with Oxycontin and Targan. You're not going to get any benefit from the Targan around uh, its potential uh, activity on glial cells because it doesn't really get absorbed into the systemic circulation because of first pass effect. If we want to look at the difference between a slow release formulation and uh, using immediate release formulations, this graph is of tramadol, it could be of anything. We can see that we have more opportunity with um, an immediate release uh, formulation to address incident pain maybe the person has to get out of bed and walk around, maybe they have to do physio, than if we have a slow release formulation in the system. And the problem would be around adding the two together because we don't know quite then what uh, drug level we're going to get. So how can we make some sense of all of this? Uh, we're still not happy with the way we use our opioids. So, we know that they're a big problem in chronic pain management and the Centre for Diseases Control in the USA has now set out uh, some guidelines uh, and this particular article is a summary of those, making some really key points about the opioids. But the important thing is that they had three key principles and I think we need to keep them in mind when we're thinking about um, acute pain management as well. Non-opioid therapy is preferred, we know that, but sometimes we need opioids for managing severe pain. We want to use the lowest possible effective dose, and again, we know that. We try to monitor for that, we try to keep people comfortable. We want to exercise caution when we're prescribing. Well, again, we know these are potentially dangerous drugs, but I think the important thing is about mitigating risk. We can recognise that these are potentially um, problematic, but we need to put in place risk management. And that might be around mixing other sedative drugs, and it might be around the monitoring. So in this month's anesthesia and analgesia, you'll find that there uh, is a, another move by the Americans trying to address their um, problems with their opioid use in the community. And in fact, the editorial suggests that anesthesiologists, that might be the new term for us yet, uh, I might tell you, uh, and other pain medicine specialists are uniquely positioned to develop, implement, and coordinate a comprehensive perioperative analgesic plan that actually continues into the discharge and convalescence period. And I would put it to you that we need to step outside of our operating theatres even step outside the hospitals and look at what important role can we have here. 
So we've learnt some lessons from uh, our publication in Anesthesia and Intensive Care. We need to be aware about this concept of an apparent ceiling effect. We know that with buprenorphine, using naloxone to reverse it can be tricky. You might need multiple doses, and in fact, three out of the six of these patients needed infusions and uh, quite prolonged high dependency or even an intensive care stay. So we have to be mindful that all opioids can cause opioid-induced ventilatory impairment, particularly mixed with other things. The other role I would suggest is that we are in a prime position to teach our junior colleagues and other uh, people in our re area, like nursing staff, for instance. Just to, the last couple of weeks, a colleague of mine was telling me about this particular fellow, pretty common problem, middle-aged male, out on his motorbike, having a nice time, and he had to have a little date with the bitumen. He ended up with multiple fractures, but nothing really uh, a major life-threatening nature. He had five days in one of our tertiary referral hospitals, and then he was referred back to his regional centre, where he turned up two days later, having been discharged with his 20 endone, to say to his GP, I need some more of these, please. And the GP said to him, well, what have you been taking? Well, 20 milligrams, four hourly and that's what I want. And the GP said, well, you know, mate, I'm not really happy to continue prescribing that. And, and the chap pulled out his discharge summary and said, well, this is what they said I could have. His discharge prescription simply said, oxycodone, 20 milligrams, four hourly, duration, one month, taper. Well, what did that mean? The patient read it, that he could have that oxycodone at that dose, at that rate, for the whole month. I don't think so. So my colleague was able to help the GP make a plan for tapering properly over that time. The intern was highly embarrassed. He said, oh, I know that that's probably not the right thing, and that's not what I meant. But this is how the patient read it. And if he hadn't had an astute GP, he may have come to some harm. So I would suggest that we need to do a bit better from the teaching perspective. So why are we still talking about this? We have our ethical obligations and none of us would deny that. We want to do better in the acute to chronic transition, but we still haven't nailed that yet either. What are our problems? It's around safety and poor outcomes still. Uh, what are the issues of our medications? I'm going to, not going to remind you of the pharmacology, you know that. Do we still have a future for opioids? Of course we do. I don't think we're ready to be opioid free in all domains yet, but we need to personalise their use and be more aware of these risk factors, such as Natalie suggested cognitive impairment and mixing sedative drugs with the opioids is fraught with hazard. So just to help you, uh, the faculty has an opioid app. You can download it onto your phone or onto your laptop computer. If you really want to do some more education, you could look at doing the better pain management modules. They're on networks on the, on the college website they're free to all of us, um, so please access them. And I'll leave you with one last thought. Thank you. Thank you very much, Meredith. Um, again, we've got one or two minutes left uh, for some questions. Uh, would anybody like to ask? Hi, Lynn Rainey from Adelaide. Thanks, Meredith. <laughs> Fabulous presentation. Um, I think that one of the things that we're, I notice that several of my colleagues say is that the problem of long-term opiate prescribing is not our problem. We actually send them home with one script. There's only 20 of endone. Um, and it's actually the GP's problem, <laughs> which is what a lot of us say. Um, you know, I like your response to that. 
I would say, uh, again, we have a role in educating GPs. I can tell you from my work these days, there is a big need for GP education. And in fact, we just recently had some discussions through the faculty with the um, Federal Minister of Health about opportunities for improving knowledge in, in primary care. Uh, alarmingly, and very sadly for me, is South Australia is one of the high opioid prescribing areas, particularly in our regional areas and our northern suburbs. There is a desperate need for education, and I think we should use every opportunity to do that. So giving clearer instructions to GPs when you're discharging your patient with some information around tapering that opioid and saying they should not be continuing on this. And I think uh, educating our surgical colleagues as well, because do they inquire when they see the patient six weeks post-op? Probably not. They just make an assumption that the patient's not using their opioid and they may well still be on those medications. So I think it's, it's sharing our knowledge. You know, we are prime in a prime position. We have the knowledge. Uh, Jim Troop from Brisbane. Meredith, we're just starting to look uh, within the Queensland Health Public side of things that are an opioid stewardship program in the same way as there's an antibiotic stewardship program. Is anything like that being done anywhere else? I'm not aware of any other active programs in Australia, but it's certainly uh, talked about in the literature now. And I, I, I think it's a, a great idea, so I will look with great interest on what you're doing. And you could send us some information. We might publish it in Anesthesia and Intensive Care. <laughs> Anybody else got a question? If that's the case, then uh, we'll call the session to a close. Thank you very much to all three of our speakers again.